Good morning and welcome to today's Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce Future of Work event sponsored by, by Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts. I'm Jim Rooney, President and CEO of the Greater Boston Chamber. When we talk about the future of working in the workplace, we know that that future is uncertain and there is a great deal of ongoing ex experimentation and businesses employees finding their way. Our ongoing goal for this series is to share information and resources that will ultimately help leaders and employees in the public and private sectors consider innovative ideas, stay ahead of the trends and keep Greater Boston's competitive edge in the global marketplace. Today's event, which is being attended by over 230 people, so it's quite topical, will be focusing on designing and sustaining the workforce and the workplace. We're joined by an impressive slate of leaders who will share ways they are navigating the future of work, particularly the design of a hybrid workforce and workplace. Before we get started, a few logistics. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be shared on the Chamber's YouTube page shortly after the presentation. Also, please submit your questions throughout the webinar using the Q&A feature on your screen and engage with other attendees in the chat. I'd now like to share a big thank you to our program sponsor, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts. Without their continued support of the Chamber, this series would not be possible. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Andriana Santangelo, Chief Financial Officer and Executive Vice President for Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts to introduce today's speaker. Thank you for being here today, Andriana. Thank you, Jim. Um, very excited to be here today. And as you already mentioned, this is a very important topic. Um, on behalf of Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts, it is my pleasure to introduce today's um, experienced and outstanding panel. First, we are thrilled to have Sarah Evans, Chief Human Resource Officer at Ocean Spray. Sarah has developed deep experience in leading global human resource teams for organizations such as Terminix, Walmart, and currently Ocean Spray. Her leadership oversees strategy for talent acquisitions, DEI, and executive success, to name just a few. So welcome, Sarah. Next, we have Darren Basco. Home, Managing Director for Proverb. Darren is the founder and creative director for the award-winning branding agency, which under his leadership has become a recognized partner for brands seeking to apply strategic design thinking to their business, products, and communication. Glad to have you with us, Darren. We've got a little bit of a glare on your screen, just so you know. Also joining us is my colleague, Jim Linehan, uh, we, we let out from his uh, busy day to do this and share all of his knowledge. He's the Vice President of Financial Services at Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts. Jim has had several progressive leadership roles, including his current role, which is responsible for the execution of Blue Cross's operating budgets. We all love operating budgets. The procurement process, procurement activity, and corporate real estate, which is no small feat these days. Thank you for being here, Jim. Next, we have Robert Kennedy, Health and Welfare Practice Leader for Fidelity Investments Workplace Consulting. Robert brings over 25 years of consulting experience in the employee benefits field and is currently responsible for monitoring the emerging healthcare landscape and then setting the strategic directions for the firm's practice as well as his clients who are focused on health and welfare consulting services. Welcome to you, Robert. And last but not least, leading today's conversation is Pallavi Verma, Quality and Risk Lead for Accenture in North America. Pallavi carries over 30 years of consulting experience and is currently responsible for working with clients to solve business problems using innovative solutions that drive quality programs across all businesses and industry. Pallavi also serves on the board of directors for the Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce. We are all very honored to have you today, and I'm very much looking forward to the conversations. With that, I'll turn it over to you to get us started, Pallavi. Thank you. Thank you, Andriana, and really excited to be here. Excited to have the great uh, participation that we have. We know that it's a, a topic on everybody's mind, and we also know that it's an ever-evolving 
uh, subject um, as our environment continues to change. So I'm gonna start out with a common question for all of the panelists first, just to get our, ourselves going here a little bit. Um, you know, all companies we know are grappling with how to bring employees back, when to bring them back. And, you know, especially because most of us have been working from home for almost two years now. Uh, multiple surveys have shown that our employees want a mix or a hybrid of some sort of in-person and remote work. And so what I'd like to ask each of you is what have been the consistent and emerging trends that you've seen in your fields as it relates to the future of work, specifically around hybrid workforce and workplaces? And then we'll get into some more detailed questions after that. So maybe Sarah, we can start with you um, on that. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, I, I think the, the most consistent thing I have seen is the important need for adaptability and just absolute being able to um, appreciate and empathize with people throughout this situation. Uh, every time somebody has said, that's it, this is our line in the sand, this is in concrete, it is now completely changing and evolving. Um, so the, the most important thing that I have found both for Ocean Spray and just the world at large is the ability and need for every everyone to be adaptable and understanding and to exercise empathy uh, as we have started to traverse how to best respond to the world uh, amidst and post and during pandemic. Uh, you know, one of the, the big things that's emerging though, specifically as it relates to the workforce, I, I found some research the other day, I think it came out of Microsoft of where, um, to your point, yes, uh, employees and people are telling us they want hybrid and how important it is. However, you're also hearing from employees that they are frustrated that we aren't able to create the culture and the experience of in-person. And so there's this natural tension with the desire to have the flexibility of remote and being able to work at a distance, but the absolute requirement from our employees to be able to create an environment that is as rewarding as the in-person experience was. Yeah, the culture point is really important. I'd love to hear more about how each of you is actually tackling that, that culture piece. I think that's, that's, a, that's an important one that we're all thinking about. So Jim, maybe I'll move over to you. Um, same question, sort of how do you, how are you thinking about um, the future of work here? Sure. Yeah. So it's going to sound a lot like what Sarah just said. I'll use the word flexibility though, to change it up a little bit. So most of my involvement in our, our preparing for this future of work is through the lens of real estate. So uh, whereas she spoke to the kind of the workforce, I think the same principle applies to our workspace. Most offices, frankly, have been set up in the same basic structure for, for decades. It's banks and rows of offices and cubes. And I think what we're learning through our migration to this hybrid model is that people don't work that way anymore. They don't just come in, sit down in their workspace from nine to five, like, like they did um, before. And even more so now when people have the option to work from home, if your job has you basically just sitting in one place working all day, chances are you're going to do that at home. So if you come into the workspace, you're looking for something different. And we know one of the things that, that's challenging in the hybrid model is that casual interaction. So when I think of flexibility, we really tried to think about our space and how do we, how do we make that easier? How do we make that inc those incidental conversations that you're missing in these kind of team, you know, Zoom structured environments? How do we make that easier for people? So I know we'll, we'll, we'll talk in more specifics later about how we've done that, but flexibility, not only for your workforce, but also your workspace and how you set it up to, to, to complement this hybrid model. Yeah, we're so glad you're here to talk about that. I think that's a really interesting topic for us to think about. Darren, how about you? Yeah, you know, I, I feel like I almost want to build on sort of many of the themes that uh, have been um, suggested so far. You know, I would say that, um, you know, you know, one of the things that we've seen inside of the pandemic, uh, you know, is that um, is that you know many people have this desire to want to bring sort of more and more of themselves, uh, you know, into the work environment, and uh, you know, and at the same time, you know, so many of us have spent so much time in isolation, you know, and and so you know, and from time to time, you know, we've all been on a Zoom where we've had a dog bark or. Uh, you know, uh, you know, kids who've come into the Zoom or, or any of those things, and you know, I, I would say that you know, you know, those things don't um, make you unprofessional. Those things make you human, and uh, 
you know, and so, you know, increasingly, uh, you know, if, if we're going to, uh, you know, expect that people are going to sort of bring more of themselves to work, well, you know, people's lives are messy. And so, you know, whatever we've tried to do has been to uh, sort of look at ways in which we can introduce an additional sense of flexibility, you know, into sort of how work gets done, you know, how we can sort of ensure that uh, we're able to maintain productivity and quality and things along those lines. But, you know, I would say that, you know, you know certainly, uh, you know, that theme is, has been uh, front and center for us. Makes sense. Fairly consistent. And then Robert, how about you from Fidelity? Well, can I just say ditto and, and we can move on. Um, I, I think I could, I could echo sort of almost all, all of those themes, uh, you know, flexibility and hybrid. I think the one uh, thing we're hearing from our clients is, is a little, um, I don't know if it's apprehension, but I, I think it's important to keep in mind, just like it used to be almost every day in the office, I don't know that we can just easily say, so when it, when this is all over, it's all hybrid. I've talked to people who want to go back full-time. I've talked to people who never want to go back into office. I think hybrid is a much bigger term than maybe you initially think, oh, that means three days a week from Tuesday to Thursday, and we'll all be back in the office otherwise and at home otherwise. I think hybrid is going to mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And I think a couple of, a couple of additional things I might can maybe add is I think the one thing we've been thinking about uh, from a collaboration perspective, obviously in-person work is where you'll collaborate and brainstorm and innovate and you know, sort of heads down work. I think uh, Jim, Jim mentioned heads down work or lots of back-to-back -back calls. Maybe you do that from home. I think when you think about that arc over a hybrid schedule, you, you could conceivably go a month or two without bumping into your coworkers based on travel and your schedule and their schedule. So I think a lot of thought needs to go into how you how you get that collaboration in a hybrid environment, it's not as easy, I don't think, as just saying it's gonna happen. And then the final piece I, I might add, just because some of our clients um, were in this boat, I mean, for some of us, um, people never left the office, right? I mean, locally, healthcare is a great, for example, uh, we have a lot of oil and gas clients. I mean, they, they never went, they, they aren't, they never left the office, so to speak. And I think there, the, the one thought I'll, I'll leave the um, uh, webinar with is, um, Locally, Dr. Lisa Berkman at Harvard is doing some amazing work around giving people control. So that's the other that's the other side of the flexibility that employers are looking to give. Employees want some control. So even in environments where you have to be on site, uh, tethered to your desk, uh, on a on an important schedule, she's shown some demonstrated some great results in giving those types of workers, and not just those of us that have more flexibility, um, control over their schedules, and it leads to some really interesting. Um, results in terms of overall well-being, productivity, just, again, that feeling of control. It, it essentially treats work as one of the social determinants of health. I, I just recommend her work to anybody who might be interested. Great re recommendation. And really, I mean, interesting, similar themes, right? We had adaptability, flexibility, collaboration. What does hybrid actually mean? I think the one point you made, Robert, which is really important, is that it is different by work group, right? So we can't define um, really what hybrid means. And even companies, companies like ours, as we're thinking about this, we're thinking about, it actually has to be by type of work and letting uh, managers sort of decide what makes sense for their work. Because if you're in the IT function, that may be very different than if you're in a client service function. Um, so I think that those are, those are key themes to you know, pull apart as we go through this. So let me go to my uh, first question. I'm going to send it to you, Darren. Start, I want to start with you and talk a little bit about your company's recent decision to relocate and buy an office in the South End. And you're quoted in the Boston Globe by saying, we're taking a long view that cities are going to thrive. Um, so with the overhead of new office space mixed with uh, employee desire, to work remotely at least some of the time. How are you thinking about designing your hybrid work model in your space? What are you prioritizing? Sure, yeah. Um, so, so first off, uh, you know, beyond sort of just thinking about an office, uh, you know, as an asset or a container for for work, uh, you know, we've really kind of taken uh, the view of of thinking about the office as a service, uh, you know, and sort of how does it actually help us to sort of advance the things that we need to do. We uh, fully recognize that, 
at least for for proverb you know that we think that hybrid is uh you know is is, is certainly here to stay or uh at, at, at least as far as we can see right now um you know but we we kind of started this exercise or kind of went into covid uh you know, already being here in the South End, uh, you know, a lot of the work that we do focuses on sort of place making uh, and place branding. And, uh, you know, to that end, you know, we're big believers that powerful brands are always connected to purpose driven organizations. Um, you know, the upside was that we were in uh, an old funky mill building uh, that if you squinted your eyes felt like you were in the Lower East Side. Uh, you know, and, and the downside was that we were in an old funky mill building uh that um had shared bathrooms and so we didn't get very far into covid before we started to realize you know that that space you know probably wasn't going to make sense for us so that we weren't going to be able to uh bring people to back safely uh you know and so we started to sort of think a bit about um uh you know what you know what do we want in an office what do we want to do next um you know the space that we wound up uh, securing uh, is a little larger than um, you know where we were previously, but you know you know it, but we we kind of uh, you know thought about it as an opportunity to uh, you know create a space that's sort of much more focused on supporting collaboration, uh, sort of looking at sort of how we can bring people together, um, you know somewhat. Um, you know, surgically, you know, assuming that the entire team isn't going to be here uh, every day. Uh, we've taken an approach of, you know, hoteling. So, you know, the desks aren't necessarily assigned to anyone in particular. Uh, you know, but what we have found is that, um, you know, our, our teammates uh, really do enjoy being around, uh, you know, each other. And, uh, you know, and I think that we've all uh, had a time or two where, you know, trying to do something through Zoom or trying to do something through email and thinking this would be so much easier. You know, it, as, as we thought a bit about, um, you know, a, a location, uh, you know, we want it to be closer to public transportation, you know, we want it to be closer to, uh, you know, you know, dining opportunities, you know, our space is very close to Whole Foods, uh, you know, we've got pure organizations, um, you know, in galleries that are here in the neighborhood. You know, and, and so, you know, I think from an imaging standpoint, it certainly has been very helpful to us, uh, you know, and, and also in, in terms of, um, you know, sort of really thinking through, uh, you know, how do we engage, you know, particularly, uh, you know, people who joined uh, Proverb inside of the last year and a half, uh, you know, how do we bring them up to speed and, and, and give them that sense of belonging? And so, you know, we really have kind of doubled down on sort of what the virtual uh, you know, experience a proverb looks like, but also uh, you know, wanted to bring folks in, um, you know, from time to time to to make sure that we feel connected. And um, how are how are your employees reacting to the new space? Yeah. Uh, people have been really excited about it. Uh, you know, both in terms of um, you know uh, you know the ways in which we've been able to use it. Um, you know, in terms of uh, you know, a lot of the flexibility that we've built into it in terms of, uh, you know, different zones and environments. Uh, you know, we also have a, access to a large private courtyard, uh, you know, which has also been uh, very helpful, uh, you know, during the warmer weather. Um, you know, and I would say that, uh, you know, we, we've also tried to, you know, make sure that the space does certain things that are harder to achieve at home. Uh, you know, we're, you know, a, a big part of what we do is focused on design. And so everything from looking at, you know, the quality of the light inside of the space and the color of the light bulbs, you know, uh, you know, to, uh, you know, the quality of sound to, um, to um, you know, almost, almost everything else, you know, really wanting to be intentional and, and create, you know, a, an office that really is a tool, uh, you know, and is anything but, uh, you know, driving in to, um, you know, sit in a beige cubicle and work on a beige box. You know, we really wanted something that um, is hard to replicate uh, at home. Great, great. Um, all right, uh, Jim, I'm gonna move to you next uh, and talk a little bit about technology and data. Um, really, it's at the forefront of the future of 
the workforce and any and the economy really right and so what have you seen uh, employers do to prioritize both inclusivity and access should we be training or retraining all of our current employees in the newest technological advances do you see security risks so i'm kind of pivoting a little bit here um, and focus on the technology with a hybrid workforce. Are there security risks? What What are some of the things that you all are focused on um, to mitigate uh, this and sort of advance the technology component of of our world these days? Sure. Okay, I can talk a little bit about that. Let me let me caveat that uh, I am not an IT guy. So uh, with that, I'll speak a Even little better, bit. Better then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. I'll say just enough to be dangerous. I'll speak a little bit about how we're thinking about technology that as it supports the hybrid model specifically. So um, so we had for well over a decade had a pretty robust uh, work from home program, more or less. We, we did have people, uh, a large number of people who rarely ever came into our workspace. So we had already done all the investments in the network and setting up you know, the, the appropriate protocols and, 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 and security measures, the VPN channels the speed and, and, you know, basically the, the, the uptime of our network, uh, all, everything that has to support that, the, the help desk, the desktop services, all that, that was all kind of in place. When I think about the, the technology specific to hybrid, it was really more about that, that next level of, you know, what, what are the tools that we're going to use at the beginning? I remember it was a little bit of the wild west people were, you know, one meeting you'd go from zoom to, blue jeans to teams and, and people didn't know how to use all these these applications. Uh, they work differently depending on what you know what notebook you had, frankly. Some uh, there were certain programs where I couldn't get my camera to turn on. It was it was a little bit crazy. So there was a lot of work done to standardize that and normalize that. We we landed on Zoom and Teams as our two primary tools. Then with that it, it becomes a conversation of how are we going to use these in a consistent way so that people know what to expect when they log into these meetings. You're going to use the little raise hand function. You're going to turn your camera on so that you can be fully engaged. If you're if you're invited to a meeting, you know you're there because we want to hear from you. We want to see you. We want to have a an interaction with you. So we are we are slowly introducing those things now and making them basically a requirement of the hybrid model. We can't we can't have people just clicking their cameras off and and, and hanging back and not being engaged. So those are the things that we're focused on now. And then obviously the training to support those things, how to, how to use them you know, is, is one thing, the real, the tactical training. I think um, what we've, we've focused on right now with our leaders is probably even more important that, that there's a mindset training that has to go with all this, right? If you, if you want to step into this hybrid model, we can't just try to replicate what we had pre COVID in a, in a, in this multi-channel format, it's not going to work. We need leaders to, to embrace the fact that you, you have to, you have to support meetings. Okay not only the presence that you have in the room, but the presence that you have in the screen. And it's really the, the, the job of the leaders and the people running meetings to, to make sure that everybody feels engaged. And I think with this technology, there's actually opportunity in some ways to do it better, right? Uh, in, in, the, in the old environment, if you were sitting at a rectangular table, you're not seeing half the people who are sitting on the same side as you. Now I can look at the screen and I can get visual cues and I can kind of see and, and engage with everybody at, at one point in time. Uh, another way I think it, it can be better technologically is the the whole the, the the ability to poll people, right? I don't know about, about you, but I know in the old days it'd say, "Hey, all right, put your hand up if you like option A, a or option B," and you could see everyone, all right, option A, and you know, looking around, whose hands going up? I'm not sure. I don't want to be the only one representing option B or or vice versa. So the ability to poll and get real input from people with without any kind of groupthink uh, pollution, I, I think is powerful. So. Uh, I know it kind of went roundabout on technology here, but I just figured I'd throw it all out there at once. It, it's a lot to consider. Uh, these are some of the things that we're focused on. We don't have them all figured out, frankly, and I think a lot of them we won't until we take that next step into the hybrid model. We're, we're having more and more people return to our building starting January 4th. So we're going to learn a lot right off the bat. Right now, we're still predominantly mobile, uh, you know, remote. So it's, we're not all the way there yet, but we've, we've thought through these things very intentionally and we're, we're hopeful that all that work is gonna make the, the experience as good as possible for as many people as possible, regardless of where you're working. Yeah, no, and I think actually technology has been a huge benefit to all of us, right? Um, think about 10 years ago, even, we wouldn't have been all as successful as we were in sort of uh, business continuity to some extent, had we not had all the technology capability that we all do. 
Um, and so figuring out how to enhance that uh, and continue to sort of create a better employee experience is really important. And uh, I don't think that will ever change. Um, so it's, it's, you know, come, everything has good and bad, but I think technology has really helped us through this pandemic for sure. All right, Sarah, I'm gonna turn over to you. Um, so in, in your current role, um, you lead the global HR team, which includes talent acquisition, diversity and inclusion. Um, and we know that designing hybrid workforces isn't just about schedules and office spaces. We have to sort of consider the equity inclusion performance measurements um, through this process. And so one question I have for you is how is onboarding involved at Ocean Spray? Um, you know, what should employers be thinking about as they are considering their efforts to design an adaptable and inclusive hybrid work environment? Yeah, uh, you know, it's funny, um, even before the pandemic happened, uh, I found myself in a former lifetime harping on the importance of onboarding because what a lot of uh, your employees will tell you and a lot of research will tell you is that your, your margin for error is quite small when it comes to hour one, day one, and week one from an employee experience standpoint. A lot of employees are making very long-term conclusions based on their onboarding experiences. And so even before the pandemic, you really needed to be focusing on this more than most people probably were. Um, and so the ways that we have evolved is really prioritizing that experience before they even start. One of the big things we know in hybrid is that you can't afford to get the technology wrong. Uh, having access to your machine, to your network, to whatever software that's going to be critical for you to do these video conversations uh, are going to be something that you, you don't have the ability to say, oh, I'm sorry, your equipment's not available on day one anymore. And so the planning that's required to making sure and as much automation as you can as part of the hiring process that you can find out exactly what their technical requirements are, how are they going to get their laptops or phones or whatever mechanisms they're going to need to be successful on day one has to be planned far in advance. Um, as it relates to the onboarding experience, I can't stress enough the importance of scheduling the entire week and weeks ahead. Uh, even if it's just previews into what chunks of work are needing to be prioritized. Um, but within the first week, my recommendation and what we have pivoted to is getting very granular, almost hour by hour, what the first day and the first week looks like so that you can make sure you've accounted for everything. Two other really big components that I highly recommend that we've started to employ is number one, identifying an onboarding buddy, uh, somebody that's within the department that is not your manager that is able to help you get access to materials, point you in directions to where things might exist. And then separately, and this is a big part for the diversity and inclusion perspective, is some kind of culture champion outside of the department in some way, shape, or form. Because what's unique about onboarding virtually is that you have to manufacture each one of these experiences. No longer do we have the ability to pass somebody in the hall and have a coffee and get introduced to somebody. And so I really, really stress having people from outside of the department, whether it's through employee resource groups, completely different offices in different locations, being very, very planful about how you manufacture these moments during the employee onboarding experience. You know, one of the, the big things for us culturally is we're owned by 700 family farmers. And one of the really big areas of pride that we had as a cooperative usually was incorporating growers into our onboarding experience to help people understand the cranberry farmer and that we work for our grower owners. And so what we've had to do is be creative of finding different ways virtually to get our grower owners to come do a, a lunch and learn or different things that we can find different ways to do our culture embedding at a distance when we know we can't do it in person in the office anymore because we can't have a farmer just completely come in for lunch and do an in-person experience anymore. So it's being creative about those, but it's being very intentional and don't underestimate the importance of the check-ins. From a hiring manager standpoint, um, having several moments in that scheduling component of when you're touching base, seeing what they need, what questions do they have, um, I'd be remiss as an HR person and practitioner if I didn't send a shout out to say onboarding is not HR's job, it is the hiring manager's job. And so making sure that the leaders and the team around those new hires that are starting is really geared up to make this experience as positive as possible, 
even at a distance. So those are just a few of the things that we've started to put into place. Um, you know, we'll, we'll hopefully start to get better and smarter with each one of these and getting feedback along the way. Um, but the good, great news is a lot of us have had some really great partners in our IT groups and other parts of the business that have really powered us up for success to make these things possible. Some great advice, Sarah, thank you. I know for us, one of the benefits actually of the pandemic is when we started people, we started to, we used to do them in cohorts in the office and now we do them cohorts nationally. And so the, one of the benefits is they actually get to meet people they wouldn't have normally met uh, across the nation rather than just well, who they met in the office. So, um, you know, there's some silver linings and everything, I think. Um, all right, Robert, I'm going to uh, turn over to you. Um, you know, your workplace consulting team helps multinational organizations design and help uh, their employee benefit strategies and supporting programs. So I think benefits is a key component of uh, our workplace of the future. Um, and so based on your expertise and observations, what should our audience employers be thinking about as they restructure their benefits in this pandemic world, post-pandemic world, I don't know if what post looks like, but what should we all be thinking about? Yeah, th thanks for the thanks for the question. So, so I guess maybe just sort of level set, context set. Um, you're sort of periodically taking a look at your benefits. We we encourage our clients to do that on sort of a natural cadence, not just at these watershed moments. Um, although certainly a, a good time to, to do so, and and to take into account, you know, what is the business need? What does that mean for your people strategy? And then what, what what actually do employees need delivered via the benefits package to, to be their most productive uh, selves at work and, and at home? And, and I think a couple of themes are emerging. So the, in addition to the pandemic or post pandemic, or I think we've maybe we're getting to the endemic stage at this point, mm -hmm. um, personalization is a huge component. So uh, sort of what I want, when I want it, how I want it. So as you think about your benefits, it's not just that you're that you've got them, that you've designed them, but sort of how you're delivering them and how I can find them as an employee when when I need them the most. I think uh, other market forces come into play. So I, I think we've all heard about the you know, sort of the great resignation. Um, employees have a lot of leverage at this point, so we're seeing a lot of our clients look for ways to improve, modernize, optimize, or or in a lot of cases add add new benefits and. There's maybe just a couple, two, three I'll touch on that, that we've seen a lot of interest from, from our clients uh, because they're hearing it from, from their employees, from their workforce. So uh, one would be in the area of caregiving. So there's a child care uh, component to that, obviously. And so you know, if, if you've got the means, maybe it's on-site child care or near-site child care, or even just sort of the resources to help um, employees navigate that complex, um, complex area. But it's not just child care, a lot of us are caring for other members of the family that aren't children necessarily. So broadly speaking, caregiving is get getting a lot of attention and it could be something as simple as uh, providing a, a service and a resource to help employees find the help they need, right? It could, it could be medical, it could be financial, it could be in-home, it could be um, lots of different community resources. The other one, uh, one or two, um, mental health is taking center stage. It, it was an issue for our clients prior to the pandemic and the pandemic didn't help. Uh, did, didn't help the mental health of our, our country at, at all. So, so reimagining sort of that employee assistance program, how we deliver mental health, what it means broadly across the organization. So, if there's still stigma within your organization, doing what you can to break that down. Um, having candid, frank conversations from leaders and managers and, and uh, leaders throughout the organization um, to get uh, employees focused on good mental health and, and overall well-being. And then maybe the final one that's it's maybe a little new and different emerging would be um, I'll call it a family forming benefit. So think of your infertility benefit and think of your adoption benefit, thinking of those together um, and throwing a DEI lens over top of that. So removing some of the barriers that historically have maybe prevented non heterosexual traditional couples from accessing those benefits and making them uh, more inclusive and, and therefore more useful to, to your entire workforce. Great. Thank you. It's really important. I think. You made a couple of points, one around mental health that I know for us has been a real area of focus, particularly because of the pandemic. And I'm sure all of you have um, had to deal with the same thing. We actually trained the majority of our leaders on mental health awareness. And actually just last night, I went through a 90 minute um, suicide training 
um, to help identify, see the signs of um, somebody that might be struggling and how to help them. So I think it's it's really um, something that's been an area of focus for us, but very impactful, uh, at least it was to me, to sort of hear the stories and learn a little bit about what are the signs, particularly as people are, um, you know, are more isolated because they're not coming out and that, that creates a whole host of issues, particularly around mental health. Um, another one I know we did, and I'm sure Robert, you recommend this to your um, clients is you know, extending, um, or extending the EAP that it, a lot of people have really, it's about how do you get access and here we had leveraged technology so people could schedule online conversations and have a, um, have a conversation with a provider on mental health that they could just do online and do it remotely. And I think uh, particularly for our younger generation, that seems to be quite an uptick and, um, you know, they're very comfortable with knowing that they need help and accessing that help. I think it's different uh, by generation. So benefits yeah, and technology good. really is helping in that regard. I mean, access yeah. to me good mental health, good mental health care has, has been a historic problem. A access hasn't solved it. Uh, technology hasn't solved that access problem, but it's absolutely helping. Yeah, it's I, I know for us it's been huge. So and huge uptick there. So. All right. So um, I'm going to kind of go to some more generic questions that I'll ask uh, all of you. Um, one of the, the questions we have is, you know, we talked a little bit about company culture. So I want to do a little bit more deep dive on that because that's such an important piece that you need to sort of proactively think about if your entire workforce is not coming in, um, regardless of what type of hybrid model you're in. Um, and so it, it's how do we create the culture? My question is going to be around how do we create the culture? How do we create innovation, creativity, collaboration? A lot of the pieces that you all talked about earlier, you know, what's the, maybe I'll ask each of you, what's the one, let's do a round robin and just do a one um, piece of advice you would give this audience around, um, culture, collaboration, innovation. I'll leave it up to you. So I'm just going uh, left to right on my screen here. So Sarah, I'll start with you. Yeah, um, so so culture will probably be the one that I kind of uh, align to. And I, I think for me, it's looking at your practices. And first of all, do you have a, a well-articulated culture, uh, whether spoken or unspoken, and identifying different mechanisms to help deliver against that and finding a different way to do it. So, you know, for example, I had mentioned uh, our grower owners, right? Quarterly conversations with them have been something that have been really meaningful for our employees to kind of thrive in our culture. Similarly, uh, finding, you know, we, we are a uh, consumer company. And so having our R&D folks and others to get on, whether it's through lunch and learns or just through informal sessions, and really finding ways to incorporate that and permeate it through a hybrid workforce has been hugely beneficial for us. And getting a little bit more comfortable, uh, being a little bit more relaxed in some places, having fun with polls during live events to, to get kind of feeds on things. But I, I can't underestimate enough the importance of having mechanisms to measure and adjust when you know that there are warning signs, that there are some things that are starting to be lost because of the hybrid workforce. Um, so one of the things that we do at least previously we did it monthly, but we did actual listening sessions, round tables with our CEO and myself every month throughout the pandemic to hear what the groundswell was and to making sure that we had a feedback loop to be able to do that, whether it's through surveys or finding other leaders on your teams to do uh, listening sessions to understand how is the culture shifting and what are the things that we need to protect versus what are the things that we need to evolve and having that adaptability to go back to our first theme that we had talked about to understand when you need to take a look at how is this going to affect your culture long term. Um, because to the point, I, I can't remember if it was Jim or Robert earlier, um, our, our, the, the employees 
employees are being able to command in the marketplace some changes that have probably been long overdue. And so this is a really huge opportunity for cultures and companies to figure out where they need to be evolving in a way that is going to set them up for the future uh, versus just surviving the pandemic. So I, I think this is one of those times where we have an inflection point to be able to learn from this experience and find things that we will never go back to because we have figured out a smarter way culturally to do this. Yeah, and I think your one point really that resonated with me, Sarah, is engagement, right? I mean, just because we're remote doesn't mean we're not engaged. And so finding the creative ways to be engaged, I think, is key to culture. Jim, how about you? Thoughts around collaboration, creativity, innovation, culture? Sure. So I'll go back to something I already touched on the last time I spoke, but I think the mindset in particular, the mindset of the leaders is, is very very important in, in doing this successfully. I know, um, you know, there's been a, a kind of an evolution of thinking for a lot of leaders who, you know, some, some of us, myself included, worked the very traditional Monday through Friday, I never really worked from home. It was not, you know, part of the equation. I was very re receptive to people on the team doing that, but it, I never thought it would work for me. And I, I think, you know, there are some who are, are learning through this process and are willing to embrace it. And I think that that comes out when you're working with your teams. And frankly, there are some leaders who still aren't quite ready to embrace it. And I think that comes out as well too. If you're not quite there yet, you are inclined to probably give those people the, the feeling that, okay, if I'm not in the building, maybe I'm not as important as those who are, that whether mm -hmm. it's subliminal or, or not, I think that's critical. So I, I do think mindset moving from accepting to embracing the hybrid model is, is going to be key to make it successful. So that, that would be one thing I'd, I'd throw out there. Um, similar to what Sarah said, I think communication is, is huge. Our CEO has also been doing with our, with our communications team a, a monthly discussion. I think in some ways our associates probably feel like they, they know more and they're, they've been brought you know behind the curtain even more than ever before. So I, I think it's actually potentially an improvement to what we had. What we had right. was great, but it, now there's the ability to, no matter where you are, you just turn your screen on, you can hear directly from our CEO and ask them questions. And it's been hugely received. And, and similarly, we, we've also done a lot of different conversations and, uh, and, and forums to discuss mental health as well. It's a huge priority for our company as well. We've, we've given uh, associates tools to, to do that and, and had forums around those sessions as well. And lastly, I'll, I'll touch back on, on workspace. That's kind of, you know, kind of what I've been most focused on. And, and again, thinking about our workspace from a more purpose-driven perspective. It, people aren't going to use the workspace the way they used it before. So how do we set it up to, to really complement those things that they want to do? We've, we've made a lot of physical changes to a lot, uh, basically all of our workspace. We've, we've refreshed it all, but we added a lot more casual uh, you know, incidental contact opportunities. We, we've added like libraries and, and lounges and coffee bars and patios. Uh, we bought cornhole sets. We've we've kind of, we kind of we've looked to some of the things that startups had done in the in the past, but really for a different reason. Really more about making sure people can continue to have those those interactions that used to be when you walk out of a meeting and you're you're walking to your next meeting, you have a five minute conversation in a hallway with someone. Uh, we know that's not going to happen if we don't really kind of encourage it and have our space be supportive of doing just that. So we're hopeful. Again, we haven't fully gone back, so you know. The other thing, the first thing I said is flexibility. When we get in there, we might realize some things don't quite work and we gotta be quick to pivot and make, make put something in place that does. Great, thank you for that. Robert, how about you? That feels like another ditto moment, but um, maybe <laughs> I might add, um, I, I think uh, as I think about this, the what what's next, uh, how work has changed, what hiring is, I, I think, uh, a reality for me is uh, the job of being a manager just got even more important and even harder. So if you think about differing schedules, different technologies, who's in the office, what kind of work is being done, how do we collaborate, how do we maintain, uh, you know, our culture? I I think you know at, at the heart of that is the manager employee relationship and and certainly what then managers are doing with their team. So I. You know, it's always been an important role. I think um, the best organizations treat it as as a as a function and a role, not just something you do on the side of your desk. And I think uh, as we've watched through the pandemic, and and as I think about what work will look like afterwards, I, I think I think that role, um, if it's possible, just got even harder to do, and and even even more critical to the success of the organization. Yeah, I agree with that totally, Darren. 
Yeah, I, I would say that, you know, um, you know, certainly in this time right now where, uh, you know, our days are so heavily scheduled, you know, sometimes in, you know, 10 or 15 minute increments, uh, you know, for us, it's been sort of, uh, sort of building in opportunities uh, in a regular way for people to connect uh, where it isn't necessarily structured, you know? So, you know, there's you know, 15 minutes that we sort of build into every day and people can kind of drop in and, uh, you know, and, and so sometimes the conversations are about work, sometimes they're not or what have you, but we found that that's actually been really helpful in terms of just keeping people connected. Um, you know, I would say that uh, sort of looking at you know, other opportunities for people to be able to share things, um, you know, collectively, uh, you know, you know, you know, you know, at one point we were giving out sort of, uh, sort of, you know, stipends for people to spend on something that brought them some joy, you know, and, you know, part of the uh, condition was that, you know, we wanted to hear what people then did with the money, uh, you know, and, and so it was great to be able to, uh, you know, kind of get to know your colleagues a little better or uh, to sort of build in a certain level of uh, friendly rivalry or things along those lines. Um, you know, I, I think that, you know, we probably all believe that, um, you know, you know, innovation is really driven by bringing new thinking to pre-existing problems and, you know, lunch and learns and things along those lines have been great for us. Um, uh, but we've really tried to open it up so that, um, you know, it, it isn't just something that's being programmed by leadership. Uh, you know, I, I would say that, you know, part of uh, the beauty of this environment is that, um, you know, a, a level of randomness or additional perspective can come from anywhere. And so, you know, really being intentional, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, leaning into the people that are a part of the organization and, you know, wanted to ensure that, uh, uh, they play an active role, you know, in the, in the things that we do. Yeah, some great advice there. I think generally kind of goes back to the themes uh, all of you said, which we started with, which was around adaptability, flexibility, having sort of the mindset, understanding that it's not a one size fits all kind of thing, right? One of the interesting things that we've done, and I'm going to move over to audience questions here in the last 10 minutes, um, but one of the things that I thought was interesting as we think about culture for us is uh, trying to figure out how to leverage technology more. Um, and we've just purchased 60,000 Oculus headsets to create a virtual reality experience for our employees. I haven't done it yet, so I can't um, talk about it, but it'd be an interesting experience. We started with the onboarding process of making people feel like they're part of the company. Um, so more to come on that I'm happy to share in six months in terms of how that's all going. Um, but I think it's an interesting way, you know, we talked about leveraging technology. How do we continue to leverage technology to create an environment um, that is both in person, not in person, remote? Um, so I think I think it'll be interesting to see how our, our employees like it. All right. Um, so I'm going to move over to audience questions here and. Um, maybe see uh, whoever wants to answer. I think you guys can pipe in or I will um, ask one of you to. Um, let's see. I've heard the great resignation referred to as the flight to purpose, highlighted that many employees are leaving their jobs because the pandemic opened their eyes to what is important and they are taking leaps of faith to pursue a passion. How can we retain our employees by helping them find their purpose in their current role? Anyone want to tackle that? Sarah. I can, uh, yeah, I can jump okay. off on this one. I love this question. And I think it is such a just uh, thoughtful and important way to look at this as an opportunity. Um, and, you know, I, I think Darren even touched on this earlier about creating a place for people to bring their whole selves to work is an opportunity where we have to really turn this into a moment of thrive. So 
first and foremost, I highly, highly recommend and fully believe in doing what I call stay interviews. Um, there are moments of inflection for people that we know from research where job search activity spikes. Uh, birthdays is one, work anniversaries is another. A third one, ironically, is like high school reunions, fun fact. Um, and so the more intimate you as a leader are connected with your employees to know when are they going to high school reunions or other components, but also are they having an opportunity to bring their full self to work and finding a way to express their passion in their work, whether through daily activities or through volunteerism or other ways that you can really create a meaningful experience at work, I think will pay dividends long term and you'll see so much better retention. Uh, so those are just a few of the things, but I, I just can't say enough how much I love that question. That's a great question. Amplifying the purpose piece. I know most companies have sort of a purpose statement, helping our employees sort of understand that purpose and then, you know, maybe creating um, opportunities for them to participate in it. Also, I think it's another key point that you can be doing. All right, I have a workspace kind of question. So this may go to you, Jim, or maybe Darren. Um, we work in an old building with mostly enclosed offices. Are people sharing offices or changing their spaces? Any advice for companies that don't have the flexibility to change their physical space? Okay. <clears throat> So that, that doesn't describe uh, our, our situation. So we, we intentionally set up our, our space to be very flexible. So you're saying you have much more permanent structure. Um, you know, maybe it's just being more creative about how you assign that space. If it sounds like you're in an environment where you don't want to be knocking walls down, things like that. But uh, I, part of the exercise for us was when we were set up, assuming that everyone was going to work Monday through Friday in their office space, all of the space, all of the space was assigned to people. Right. And we knew even before the pandemic, most almost half the time they weren't actually coming in and using it. So, you know, I know a lot of people don't like thinking about the, the hoteling process or whatever. But if you're able to have people in less fixed space, meaning they're, they're in space that they reserve, it's going to free up um, space for you to do other things with, you know, that that kind of casual interaction like we've been talking about able to add a lounge in maybe uh, we have lots of different uh, we have walk stations right cubes where you set up and you can actually walk on a treadmill different opportunities for people to work differently uh, all of our our workstations are equipped with sit to stand height adjustable desks maybe you could have a, a space where you could introduce something like that just you know remember if, if i think by and large if people are going to just be sitting in one space working at their machine all day and if they have the option to do that from home that's really makes sense for them to do it there, right? It's the environment set up exactly the way, way they want it. So when they come into that workspace, they're probably looking for something different. So you gotta find a, a way to free up some space that you can do some creative and interesting things with. And I also just, just to, I'll throw it in there, natural light and the ability to bring light in your workspace makes a huge difference. It, it, it's often overlooked. I know uh, a lot of people wanna come in and okay, here, here we got all these windows, beautiful windows, let's put up these permanent walls right? So that people in offices have privacy. Well, there goes all the natural light of the whole floor. People sitting out in, in, in the workstations are affected by that. So uh, it's a bit of a tangent here, but I'll just throw my plug in for natural light while I have the-, the I see your natural light and I see Darren's very large natural light in his background there. Uh, Darren, anything else you wanted to add, want to add to that question? Yeah, you know, I, I, I would probably just uh, kind of build off of many of these points and, and, and say, you know, even if you can't take down partitions, you know, looking at the surfaces, you know, and how do you actually make them more useful, you know, and so whether that's, you know, you know, idea paint or coat of paint or wallpaper or, uh, you know, sort of the, you know, looking at things like, you know, the air quality, uh, that was something that was sort of front and center, uh, for us as we were sort of thinking about sort of this new space and, you know, things that we wanted to be able to promise, uh, you know, to our team members, uh, you know, even looking at things like, uh, you know, you know, plants or trees or, you know, or, or other things that sort of make the environment a, a great deal more stimulating. You know, I, I would just underscore, you know, uh, you know, even if you're not removing walls, uh, you know, really just looking at sort of how you can, um, you know, bring a, a greater degree of variety, uh, you know, of work environments, you know, just given that, uh, oftentimes, you know, not everyone is in the space uh, at the same time currently. Great, thank you. And I think hoteling also is 
a uh, way to leverage the space you have uh, also. All right, I think we have time for one last question. Um, I'm gonna read it and then you guys can decide who wants to pick it up. Um, how to deal with bringing employees back to a hybrid environment uh, when some have relocated due to the pandemic. For example, I have two employees, same age, same title, same responsibilities. One moved to the Cape during the pandemic, but one is still local to the office. Is it fair to ask the employee that is local to come back to the office two times a week, but not the one that had to move further away? Who wants to tackle that one? It's a little juicy. So this happened to me. This one okay. happened to me several times. Um, uh, so I, I can't stress enough the objectivity of evaluating roles for remote um, and then going to and applying that same philosophy to each individual in that role. Uh, so we actually built a framework to help us identify if the role was capable of being done remote full time or not. And what that did was this made this less about the individual and more about the work that had to be done and enabled us to go back and to say, the role is going to require that, and we made a choice early on in the pandemic. We, um, I say early on, it's not really, it just seems like it was a long time ago. Uh, in June, we wanted to lead on return to office. And so we made the declaration that we would never return to office on Mondays or Fridays. And that when the time comes, uh, we will be there Tuesday through Thursday. And so when we put in place this objective evaluation of the role requirements, and if we had that same scenario where we had two people doing the same work, one had moved, although some of mine moved to like Florida and California and Arizona, they took bigger leaps than the Cape. Um, and what we said was the role, once we do come back, is going to require that you are capable of working in the office Tuesday through Thursday as prescribed. If you're not able to meet the requirements of that role, unfortunately, we're going to have to part ways when that time comes. And so it made it a lot less about the person uh, and a lot object more objective with the role and the requirements of the role and, and enabled us to be able to have some tough conversations and also to making sure we were payrolling them in the right state, um, which was a big issue uh, for people who yeah. just up to moved. Yeah. Yeah. Not to, not to pile on, but I, I think to pick up on Sarah's, I, I think it gets to that question of what does hybrid mean, right? I mean, I think, you know, it presupposes the answer to hybrid might be in, everyone has to be in the office two days a week. I don't know that that's going to be the case for every employee. I, I like Sarah's suggestion about having it be role-based, but I think you almost have to start with the question of why is in-person important? Is it because the role requires it or is it because that's what we used to do in 2019 and we all miss 2019? Yeah, I think, you know, I, I'll wrap up by saying, you know, the themes that we heard early on um, really around this is about flexibility, adaptability, understanding what the requirements actually are, as you just said, Robert, um, and then being consistent about it. I think that was the crux of the question that was asked, um, but really do it taking a step back to say, what do you what do you really need? What do you need for the work to be done? And then there's the culture component, too, in terms of you know, what do you want from creating a culture? And does that mean you have to go back to the office? Um, I think the one thing that we've been very um, thoughtful about or continuing to be thoughtful about is looking at every group differently. Like it's not a one size fits all for every employee that we have. It has to be by function. Um, so uh, hopefully all of you found that helpful and useful. We tried to get to as many questions as we could. Thank you to all the panelists for uh, an amazing job and sharing your stories. I really enjoyed hearing all of them. I'm going to turn it back over to you, Jim. Well, thank you, Pallavi, and thank you, Sarah and Darren and Jim and, and Robert for a rich and thought-provoking uh, conversation, sharing your wisdom and your experiences. Uh, at a time when we're all thinking about this, both businesses and employees are uh, trying to figure out the path forward. So uh, having these conversations is especially important. Um, and to our viewers, I hope you found this useful um, and that you'll continue to interact with us. We want this series to be interactive. We want to hear from you, hear your ideas, hear what you'd like um, us to talk about uh, during the, the series that will be uh, helpful to you, so reach out uh, to the chamber uh, and uh, stay with us. Before, be sure to follow us on 
social media and our newsletters and we check in on our website for more information about our future of work series. Uh, we want to keep this conversation going and we're thankful to Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts for, uh, for sponsoring the series and enabling us to have this uh, important conversation. Um, a programming note, we hope you will join us for the Pinnacle Awards, uh, the Chamber's program that recognizes the achievement of uh, women leaders in our community. Um, it's always a great event. Uh, this year will be January 27th and 28th. Uh, we're aiming to have a live event at the uh, new Omni Hotel in the, in the Seaport District, so keep an eye out for notices uh, for our Pinnacle Awards. Once again, thank you to all of our speakers today and thank you all for joining us and i hope everyone has a safe and happy holiday season thank you